Okay, so this was early this year, late last year. For context, I live right across from a state park. My family has lived here our whole lives, and I'm the fifth generation in this house. It's very quaint. We have a quiet road mostly filled with grandparents and the recently retired. The park is always filled with cute families and their dogs just taking a stroll. Basically, nothing ever weird happens ever. With that being said, one night around 9 to 10 p.m., my friend wanted me to come over and hang out with her and discuss her wedding plans. She lives maybe two minutes away. It sounded like fun, so I was on my way. From my driveway, if you turn left, it's pretty open and the trees don't cover much of the road. However, if you turn right, there's a lot of trees on either side that make the road darker than it already is since our road doesn't have any street lamps. As you're probably guessing, to go to my friend's house, I have to turn right. As I'm going down the road, I notice a figure of a man, tall, slim, with dark clothing. He has a backpack on and possibly long hair. He's walking down the opposite side of the road. This is definitely strange because I've never seen anyone walking around this late at night. As I get closer, I notice he's walking backwards, just staring at me. Obviously, I slow down a bit because I don't want to possibly hit the man. But as I passed him, he kept eye contact with me. The soul-piercing eye contact while still walking backwards. I immediately got chills down my spine. My stomach turned into a bottomless pit. Once my neck couldn't turn anymore, I sped off and ran through the next stop sign because I didn't want any possibility of him getting any closer to me. I have never gotten such bad vibes from any human in my entire life. I didn't see him again on the way back home. I actually have no idea if he wanted to hitch a ride or what. But why was he staring me down like that? Like I was prey? I'll never know. I was a pretty brave person when I was younger. Or maybe, it was just that young feeling, that young naive feeling of invincibility. I'd survived some things. A stalker who pursued my sister and I for over a year and a half. Being assaulted, two house fires, and growing up in a house that I swear to you was haunted. And not in that Disney way either. I'm talking torture chamber in the basement and strange things going on at all hours of the day and night. Anyway, I suppose looking back, that having been through all that just made me feel a little like either I was invincible or maybe I just assumed that I'd gotten all the bad stuff out of the way and nothing else would happen. Whatever it was, I would soon learn how wrong I really was. When I was 17, I didn't have a driver's license. In fact, it wasn't until I was 36 before I did, so I would walk most places, occasionally catching rides with friends, and less occasionally, hitchhiking. The night in question was one of those seldom seen occasions where I decided to hitchhike. Having worked very late, and being too exhausted to walk. Now most of the time when I hitch a ride, I wouldn't get in the car with a lone man. Only women, or rarely men with a wife or girlfriend and or kids in the car. This night though, cars were few and far between, and it was really cold. And really, when he pulled over, I took a good look and figured I could take him if he tried anything. He was on the slender side. He had a strange frailness about him, even though he looked healthy enough. I got into the car after we agreed on a destination. We exchanged names and I warmed my fingers in front of the heating vent. He spoke quietly, asking a few questions along the lines of whether I was a local and how did I like living here. He said he'd only been here for a couple of months, but found it beautiful and hoped he could find happiness here. That comment struck me as a little odd, but I brushed it off. It began to snow and the road quickly got slippery. So he slowed and kept his eyes straight out the windshield, driving silently. I was okay with that. The small talk was never my forte. About 10 minutes later, I noticed a car nearing the intersection we were approaching. 
and it seemed to be sliding, so I said, Watch out! He immediately hit the gas, shooting through that intersection and bursting out with, Don't ever scream at me. Needless to say, I was taken aback, and I replied with, Look, this is close enough. Just pull over. I can get there on my own. He didn't seem to hear me. Um, Richard, did you hear me? I said you can pull over here and let me out. No response. He just stared straight ahead, driving faster now than he'd had since it began to snow. See, I was scared didn't seem to cover the depth of fear that began to arise in me. I didn't know if I should stay quiet or speak, but I was damn sure not going to yell after his outburst. After about a mile or so, he began to mumble under his breath, and I couldn't quite make out what he was saying, but I assumed he was speaking to me, so I said, Hmm? I, I can't hear you. He began to speak quietly, rapidly, saying things like, Don't yell at me. I told you time and time again, I do not appreciate being yelled at. But do you listen? No. I'm done listening to you now. Do you hear that? I was at a complete loss. Didn't know what to say in response, or if I should say anything at all. I contemplated just jumping out of the car, but quickly nixed that idea when I realized the door lock was missing. There was just a silver-lined hole where it should have been. I started to cry and debate with myself about causing an accident by grabbing the wheel and just hoping for the best. When he suddenly looked at me for the first time since I'd gotten into the car, he blinked several times, rapidly and slowed the car and pulled into a gas station. I waited to see if he'd unlock the door, not wanting to say anything to set him off once more. After a minute or two, he quietly said, I, I think I better let you out here. Then hit the button to open the locks. I definitely wasn't about to hesitate. I jumped out of the car as if it were on fire. I was about to turn and walk into the gas station when he called my name. He looked so damn sad I hesitated. He apologized, said he was sorry he frightened me, and that he would have never harmed me, and asked if I'd be able to get home okay. I said I would and closed the door. He began to pull out of the gas station lot now, but stopped suddenly. He just sat there for a couple of moments, his head down. I froze, wondering what the hell he was up to, and was about to just run into the station, but he opened up his window and yelled to me waving something in his hand. My hat. I'd left it on his seat. I wearily approached the side of his car, and he handed it to me apologizing again. I didn't really know what else to say, so I just said, thanks. I watched as he drove off, making sure he was out of sight before moving on so he wouldn't know what direction I was heading in. In that moment, I decided to go to a friend's house instead of heading to mine. As I walked, I went to put my hat back on, and out fell a piece of paper. Folded into the paper was a hundred dollar bill. The paper said, I'm sorry, please take a cab and don't hitchhike anymore tonight. I didn't. And in fact, it was the last time I ever hitched a ride alone. First of all, I want to apologize for any mistakes. English isn't my first language, and even though I'll try my best to avoid it, I'll probably mess something up. The story took place two years ago. I was on my second week backpacking through Austria, and I'd reached a point where I was way too exhausted to walk any longer. It was an unusually hot day. I had blisters all over my feet, and I was ready to call it quits. I was in the middle of nowhere, and decided to thumb a lift up to the nearest train station, but I was out of luck. I stood there for what felt like hours, and no car would pick me up. I don't really blame them. I had spent two weeks sleeping in the woods, my clothes were dirty, and I probably looked like a maniac. When finally, a truck pulled up, and I didn't hesitate to hop inside because I was so thankful to be able to sit and rest my feet for a while. I asked the driver if he could drop me off at the nearest station so that I could catch a train to Vienna. But he told me that he was heading back there anyway, and that he could take me there as long as I didn't mind him making a stopover to load the truck. I didn't, 
so we drove along. We made some small talk and he seemed to be very polite. It was a pretty enjoyable ride until we reached the first stop. He loaded his truck while I walked around a bit, bought some water at a gas station nearby. He offered me a drink a few times along the ride, but I always declined because I just don't feel comfortable with that. I got back into the truck not long after and we continued the drive to Vienna. Almost immediately after we took off again, he told me that it wouldn't be a problem for him if I wanted to take off some clothes since it was such a hot day. I told him that I was fine, but he began to bring it up a few more times. He also asked me if I wanted to take a nap in the back and that several hitchhikers had been sleeping there in the past. I again declined and began to feel a little uneasy around him now and planned to leave the truck at the next gas stop. All of a sudden, he nearly yelled at me to put my head down and hide because he was driving past his stepfather's car and he didn't want him to see that he had me in the truck. That struck me as odd, but I did it anyway because his yelling took me by surprise. That confirmed my resolution to get out of there as soon as possible and I asked him to drop me off for the next stop, made up an excuse that it was my goal to enter Vienna by foot and that I was rested enough to make it now, thanks to his lift. He agreed and I began to get my stuff ready. He then turned to me and said that I looked familiar, that he was sure he saw me at somewhere before. I just shrugged it off, but he kept insisting that he remembered my face. He asked me if I ever went to a swingers club because he was sure he saw me there sometime. That really caught me off guard. I told him that that was impossible because I'd never been to one. Well, do you want to? I'm going to one in Vienna. Let's go there together. I'm sure you'll like it. At this point, I really wanted to get out of the truck ASAP. I told him that I had no intention to come with him and asked him to drop me off now. He didn't answer, but actually reached into his pants and started touching himself as he drove along. I froze up, clutching my backpack on my lap and didn't know what to do. I kept thinking that I'd jump off as soon as he stopped somewhere and tried to ignore what he was doing since he didn't respond to my plea to let me out. The gas station was coming up. He stopped what he was doing and asked if we could take a shower together. I figured there'd be people around and that would make it easier to get rid of him. So I told him sure, why not? He pulled up and as soon as he stopped, I yanked open the door and ran across the parking area of the gas station, hoping that he wouldn't come after me. He didn't, so I just kept running until the station was out of sight and I reached a busy street. Only after my heart stopped racing and I caught my breath that I realized I had left my shoes in the truck. I walked the last few kilometers barefoot and kept a lookout for that truck until I finally reached Vienna. I've wanted to post on this sub for a long time, escaping harrowing situations with creeps, sociopaths, and other narduels is something I've had to do many times. This is only my second post ever on reddit and the first one got deleted, so please go easy on my old ass. This took place during the late summer of 1993. I was living in Montana but had a boyfriend in the British Columbia and I often traveled between the two places. We were broke and careless, so we hitchhiked when we needed to get somewhere further than biking distance. I had spent the month of August with him in the BC, and eventually it was time to go back to school. I, of course not working much of the summer, had no money. My bum ass boyfriend hadn't come through with any money for a bus ticket either. My parents were mad at me, so they weren't giving me any money either. All of my friends were broke, but we didn't have a phone to call them anyway. We were living in a two bedroom cabin with no running water in the mountains. The only phone was a party line that belonged to the neighbors and was basically only for emergency purposes. The decision was made. I was already two days late for school and I didn't feel like panhandling for a bus ticket. I had to get back and couldn't wait for the boyfriend's money to materialize. This would be my first time hitchhiking alone. I put my backpacks worth of stuff together making sure I had my ID, because one time we hitched to the border, left Canada and tried to get back into the US before I realized I had left my ID in Canada, meaning I had no ID to enter the US 
but also had no ID to get back into Canada. Now that's a story for another day. Things were surprisingly smooth for the majority of the trip. An elderly couple picked me up as soon as I got off the mountain and into town, and they took me all the way to Creston, right near the border crossing. I then walked across and was picked up almost immediately by a guy who at first gave me the mild creeps, but all he did was lecture me about how dangerous it was to hitchhike alone, and how much I reminded him of his daughter. He took me all the way to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which was damn near half the trip. I was actually having phenomenal luck. I walked just outside the city limits and stuck my thumb out. One hour went by, then two. You're often walking really slowly when you're trying to catch a ride and eventually, I came across a small flap of cardboard. I picked it up and thinking I could walk off the next exit, borrow a marker at a gas station and make a sign. I thought this might help me actually get a ride. So I'm walking a little faster now and suddenly, I see something moving in my peripheral vision. I tense up and look, and see that it's a two foot thin, dark snake trying to get over the cement guardrail to the shoulder. He was never going to make it. He was trying to throw himself over it sideways. I happen to like snakes, and he looked pretty harmless. So I used my sign as a shovel and picked him up and over the wall. In hindsight, I should have realized that the snake was a bad omen. Before I could reach the next exit, a car slowed to a stop. It's always creepy when a car stops and you're walking up to it, trying to judge if it's Ted Bundy or just an eccentric like you. My heart always sank a little when it would just be a single man, but I soon realized he wasn't alone. There was a kid in the front seat who looked to be the age of 10 to 13, and this guy was a little too friendly, but what was he going to do, murder me in front of his kid? Again, I was young and very dumb so I just decided to get in. The man was really chatty, introducing the kid as his nephew, and that they were driving back to where they live in St. Louis, visiting his brother in Seattle, so the kid could visit his grandma. The kid hardly said a word. If I remember, it's been a very long time. It's about three hours to where I live in Coeur d'Alene, and he was taking Highway 90 right past the city I lived in, so I was relieved I wouldn't have to get out of the car and thumb it up again. The first hour goes by. It's friendly chit chats back and forth, lots of family anecdotes, and general small talk. The switchblade my boyfriend gave me was cradled in the bottom of my palm the whole time, up my sleeve and out of view. But I began to relax a little. He kept up with the friendly chatter, but eventually the questions he was asking took a raunchier turn. Like, did I have a boyfriend? What was he like? What did we like to do? What was our favorite position? Uh, what? I silently panic. Okay, this, this guy's a creep after all. My instinct was to play along with this conversation while I tried to figure out what to do. I was pretty sure the drink he had in the console had more than just pop in it, because you could see him physically getting looser as the drive went on. He continued asking gross questions, and I was so embarrassed for his nephew, but I was still playing along. I just tried to breathe deeply to keep from having an anxiety attack and concentrated on my exiting strategy from the car. Eventually, he made it clear that he was expecting me to have sex with him in exchange for the ride. Door to door service, he said. Then it got worse. You find one of your girlfriends for my nephew, he said with this hyper cheerful, accompanied with this menacing smile that made my stomach drop. Yeah, I had to get away from this guy as soon as possible. At this point, we were 20 miles from the town I lived in, and I was like, sure, sure, and started making stuff up about a phantom hot slutty friend I had. Then it finally hit me what I could do to get away. I put on my best come hither smile and said to him, you know what? I bet she's home now. Let's go straight over to her place, and when we get to town, let's get this date started. So I had him get off at my exit and asked him if he could get some beers first for our date. In Montana, you could buy beer at gas stations, so I had him stop at a place a few blocks from where I lived. When he somewhat reluctantly went inside to buy beer, which I knew was at the back of the store, I opened up my door and sprinted down the alley about a block and dove into a huge clump of bushes, folded myself up as tight as I could, and waited. 
I still had my knife, but it was now out of my sleeve. I was shaking, and my heart was pounding so hard I was afraid it would explode. I tucked my head into my knees and waited, listening for his car to come down the alley. We had gotten to the gas station. It was around 4 p.m. and September, so there was still plenty of light. I stayed in those damn bushes until night fell, and then finally sprinted home. His car never came down that alley, but I could hear him yelling for me, and he sounded pissed. I got in my front door, locked the deadbolt, and collapsed. Dirt and leaves all over me. My roommate was like, what happened to you? I told her the abbreviated version, and she said, why didn't you call me? I would have picked you up at the border. I spent the past six months studying abroad in Brisbane, Australia. Of course, studying abroad requires little actual studying and a lot of traveling. In June, one of my housemates and I decided to spend a week in Sydney since our exams were over sooner than we anticipated. Our flights back to Brisbane were separate flights because his was at noon and was way more expensive than my flight, which was at 6 a.m. I quickly discovered mine was cheaper because it was harder to get to the airport at that hour. I needed to get to the airport by 5 to check in, and the only way to do so, besides a cab, which is super expensive, would be to catch a 4 a.m. train from the museum station. I decided my best option would be to leave my hostel around midnight, when people are still out and about partying and whatnot as opposed to leaving at more of a dodgy hour like 3, and I would spend a few hours at the train station where I assumed I would be safe. I left my hostel myself at midnight. It was a freezing cold winter in Australia, as well as pouring down rain. My smartphone from home was broken. My new one had yet to be shipped to my house, so all I had was my cheap prepaid Australian phone. This meant no GPS, so I had to rely on literal map for directions. As soon as I step outside my hostel, my map becomes pretty much drenched by the rain. I'm clearly lost, trying to examine it and pacing around outside my hostel. A man who doesn't look much older than myself approaches me. He's wearing a work uniform, a hat and shirt from some pizza place. He asks me if I'm looking for something and tells me I look lost. I explain to him that I'm looking for the museum station. He points into the distance. Well, over that way, but if you want, I can drive you. I'm a pizza delivery driver and I'm working right now, but I'll pass the museum station anyway. I hesitate for a second, but then I decide it might be more reliable than me getting lost in the rain and then missing my flight and everything. Plus, since I know where he works from his uniform, I decide he's trustworthy. I ask him his name and where he works before I accept the offer. I learn his name and that he's 24 years old from Nepal and works at King's Crossing in Sydney. I've forgotten what the name of the actual restaurant is. I accept his offer and follow him to his car. Sitting on the passenger seat is one of those pizza box carrying cases and the car smells of pizza so I trust the fact that he is actually working. We're making small talk while he drives around. I tell him my flight is at 6 and the train is at 4. He tells me the train station is not a safe place to wait by myself at those hours, and that if I be willing to wait for him until he finishes his shift, he will drive me all the way to the airport, which is a little ways out the city. I gratefully accept, but I have to wait until 1.30. The car is warm and I am grateful for this guy's favor, so I don't mind. I just sit in his car while he drives back and forth between the pizza place and different residences, delivering the pizzas. Finally, his shift is over, and so he drives me back to the pizza place to clock out. He comes back to the car, and he brings me a huge, delicious-looking and smelling pizza for free, and a bottle of Coke. This is for you. If you want a water or a jacket or anything, I can just give you that. Just let me know. He tells me. I thank him and start eating the pizza while he begins the drive to the airport. It's all going fine and well, until suddenly... He does a total 180. How long have you been in Sydney? He asks. A week. Well, have you had sex with anyone in Sydney? 
I'm so alarmed that I'm speechless. You should. He continues. Because then you'll remember the city forever. No, I'm, I'm okay with buying souvenirs and just taking pictures of the landscape. I try to keep it casual. Do you have a boyfriend? He then asks. No, I say. I realized this was dumb and I should have just said yes, but oh well. Hindsight is twenty twenty, right? You need a hot partner with a hot body to keep you warm in this weather. You're cute, so I bet you have a hot body under those clothes. I'm a pretty awkward person. I have no idea what to say. So instead, I just eat my pizza so I have an excuse not to talk. Then, he puts his hand on the back of my head and starts massaging my hair. I continue eating the pizza and don't react. His hand moves to my face and then begins tracing the line of my jaw, as I'm still chewing the pizza. Then his fingers to my lips, which he traces as well, and sticks his finger in my mouth. Again, I'm still chewing my pizza. I'm eating the pizza you got me, I say. So he withdraws his hand. And there's a red light, and he stops as you do. When he stops, he turns to me and demands. Kiss me. I'm eating, I say, with the full mouth of pizza. I'll wait. So obviously, I take as long as I possibly can to chew my food. The light turns green again, so he turns his attention back to driving. On the way to the airport, there are heaps of signs pointing to the airport. So I watch the signs, waiting for the moment when there's a fork in the road. Airport this way, middle of nowhere Australia that way. But he's following all the airport signs. I guess it's obvious that I'm watching the signs because he says, What? You don't trust me? I can't, because I'm obviously in his car, so I just tell him, of course I trust you. It's nowhere near five. Would you rather just come back to my house and wait there so you don't have to wait alone at the airport? He asks. I tell him, no thanks. I don't want to risk missing my flight. He keeps asking and telling me he will keep me warm there, and I keep saying no. Finally, we get to the airport domestic terminal. It's about 2 a.m., and he pulls up to let me out. As I'm gathering my bags, he slams his arm across my chest. Wait, I want you to kiss me. I said no thank you. Then he proceeds to beg me more and more to come to his house. I keep saying no with the excuse that I don't want to miss my flight. Then he offers instead that we can pull his car over up the road from the airport and wait inside there. He said he would even let me take a nap. I tell him once more, no. Finally, I decide to bargain with him. Told him that I'd give him my number. If he's ever in Brisbane, we can hang out. Of course, I won't do that, but I have to bargain my way out of this situation somehow because he won't listen to my constant no's. I give the number to my Australian phone, and he tells me he'll text me his name, so I'll have his number too. He typed it out, and I guess my phone was on silent because he said, I didn't hear your phone ring. Show me it, so I know you got the text. Well, I actually gave him the right number, so I show him the text, and he tells me bye, and he looks forward to seeing me in Brisbane. Gather my things and get out of the car, reluctant to finally be at the airport. This guy drives away, but he stops at the curb just sitting there, watching me. No matter, I think. I'll be safe inside the airport. The airport has all its lights on, and everything seems to be running. But I go to open the door, and... It's locked. I check a nearby sign. The airport opens at 4 a.m. It's only just past 2 now. This guy is watching me from the curb and there is no one else around. Panicking, I walk the opposite way. And thankfully, I see a man who is clearly waiting to get into the airport as well, since he had his bags and whatnot. I tell him about that creepy guy and ask if I can sit with him and wait for the airport to open. He turned out to be a very nice older Australian guy and tells me about his girlfriend that is going to meet him at the airport at 6, and about the new boat they just recently bought for their home at the Gold Coast. He had a bottle of ginger wine and suggested we split it. We watched a documentary about Vikings on his iPad while we drank the ginger wine, and in the cold and wait for the airport to open. The entire time the pizza guy was parked at the curb, watching until 4am when people started arriving, and the airport finally opened. Then he finally drove away. 
Over the next few days, I got texts from him saying that he missed me, and it was lovely meeting me, and all of his texts were signed, Kisses. I never replied. I even got a few calls from him that I left unanswered. I'm back home in America now, and no longer have my Australian cell phone. So I finally and thankfully haven't heard from Pizza Delivery Man anymore. Pizza Delivery Guy, let's not meet again. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around to this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Facebook, you can stalk me on Twitter, and you can also stalk me on Instagram. All these links are below. What's going on guys? I hope you like this episode. I think this is definitely one of my favorite ones I've done in a while. The stories that I found are really fucking good. And I had a lot of fun making this one, so I appreciate to the people that uh, sent me their story, sent sent me their stories that I read on this one. And I'm looking forward to making the next one. Drop a comment below and let me know of a theme that you'd like to hear next. I'm definitely looking and interested in finding something a little out of the ordinary, something out of the box that we don't hear enough on the horror narration channel. So if you got something in mind. Regardless of what it is, drop it below so I can add it to my list of stuff I want to get to at some point in the future. No idea what I'm doing next. More than likely, it'll probably be a True Scary Stories since I was kind of back and forth between doing a True Scary Stories on this one or making it another themed one. And I hadn't done a hitchhiking one in a while, so I figured, what the hell, let's do that. I enjoy hitchhiking stories, and I hope you do too. So that will more than likely be the next one. The next episode, I'm I'm probably gonna theme a lot, if not all, the stories next month, Halloween, because it's October, spooky season. Let's fucking go, you know. Uh, can't help myself. Love Halloween. You already know I do. Talk about it all the time. It's the best time of the year. This weather's awesome. Hoodie season, windy, cloudy. You know, like 50s, low 60s. Perfect. Love it. I could have that weather all year round. So, yeah, I don't think I got much else. I will uh, see you guys in the next one. Cheers. Also, fun fact for you. Some kids can pee their name in the snow. Chuck Norris can pee his name into concrete. <laughs>